Okay, my friend, it's been quite a while since I posted a video on My Say Anything Goes, but I specifically was waiting for this day for a very specific moment. And if you're a Rolling Stones fan, you will know, like what I know, that this is a very bad day for the Rolling Stones 50 years ago. And I'm talking on December 6th, 1969, when the Rolling Stones made the tragic mistake of having the Altamont Free Concert in Altamont, California, at the Altamont Speedway. Now, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, let me give you a little bit of background. In 1969, as many people you may remember, um, the Woodstock concert occurred in upstate New York. And a lot of bands played there. The Who played there, a number of other bands. And it was a free concert of you know, love and peace and togetherness and what have you. And the Stones didn't show. And the Stones kind of got a little bit of flack for not showing up. All right? And they were actually stung by the criticism for not appearing at Woodstock. So the Stones decided to make the tour of uh, North America in 1969. Now remember what happened to the build-up to this. In June of 69, uh, around that time, they kicked Brian Jones out of the band. And they replaced him with Mick Taylor. And then roughly within a month later, Brian Jones was found dead in the swimming pool. So he's dead. And one of the reasons, though, getting a little bit back sidetracked, but the reason why they kicked Brian out was that the Stones wanted to go on tour and there was no possible way that they could with Brian Jones because he had all these drug convictions and he was barred from going to any country. And at this point, he was a real mess. And unfortunately, uh, the Stones, you know, got rid of him. Uh, and if uh, you see the movie Stoned, which is kind of a semi-autobiographical uh, video about Brian Jones, you see the whole story of him falling apart mentally and physically and what have you. Now, anyway, so getting back to this, so as I said, uh, the Stones didn't appear at Woodstock, and their fans, a lot of people were upset by that. And the Stones were stung by that criticism, so they said, let's try to make up for it. So in the tail end of 69, the Stones toured North America, and they actually played at Madison Square Garden. And, and this actually can be found on the Get Your Yaya's Out DVD or album, depending on how old you are like me. <laughs> so uh, the Stones toured, and but... And they were very good, but a lot of people were complaining. The Stones were charging a, then astronomical $15 a ticket for the Stones to show up and play. And they were showing up late, like 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night. People work the next day, so they're complaining about it. So the Stones decided to give a free concert at the end of the year. And I believe it was going to be a different date. And they tried to do it at this one park, Golden Gate Park, where I think it was the Haight-Ashbury Festival a few weeks prior to that. And... A month prior to that, and the cops in California weren't keen on that. So then they were going to try to have it at the football stadium, but there was a 49ers game, I believe, scheduled for that that uh, that day. And so they were going to go to Sears Point Raceway. Now, what happened was, is that I think about a day or two before the concert was to occur at Sears Point Raceway, um... See, they wanted, like, Filmways wanted, like, an astronomical amount of money, like $1 million in, in deposit uh, for to make to have the film rights for the concert film that was going to be made. And the Stones were like, no, we're not going to do that. So they backed down. Now, this, a lot of this legal wrangling is well documented in the Albert and uh, uh, Albert Maisie's film, uh, the Maisie Brothers uh, uh, film, uh, Give Me Shelter, which chronicles the Altamont concert and the legal wranglings that uh, uh, occur before that. And I think some of the footage in this movie really uh, shows the Stones in a bad light because um, Melvin Belli, and if you're a Star Trek fan, he played the Gorgon and in, in, in the end children and the episode and the children shall lead. He was also the attorney that represented Jack Ruby, the gentleman who shot Lee Harvey Oswald. So he's been retained by the Stones because uh, the Stones, you know, want to go through at Sears Point Raceway. And so Melvin Belli is talking about getting an order to show cause, which if you're an attorney, um, that means a hearing on shorty notice, because usually when you make a motion to the court to get relief, you need like a certain amount of days, you know, procedurally 13 days notice or, you know, in New York, it's 13 days notice. But you can bring what's called an order to show cause on short notice, usually for emergency relief. And so... Melvin Belli was preparing to do that to get basically a, a, a injunctive relief, like a TRO or an injunction directing that the Stones could play at Sears Point Raceway because of this last minute like switch up asking for all this money for a down payment for a film uh, of the concert. So 
and actually some of the Stones personnel are at Melvin Belli's office and they're saying, look, the, you know, we can't go anyplace else. The generator's there. We're all good to go. And so, you know, and that I think was pretty damning because as you people know, or what happened was that didn't happen. The, the Stones did not play at Sears Point Raceway. So um, while this wrangling and negotiation is going on, uh, Melvin Belli's office receives a phone call from Dick Carter, who has the Altamont Speedway. And Mr. Carter offers his Speedway for the Stones to play there for free. And what's really kind of a little bit disturbing is that uh, the Stones were in a rush to get this movie out. For some reason, they felt like they had to get this movie out before the movie of Woodstock made it out. And they were kind of like really pursuing somewhat a reckless abandon here with, of this course of action that they took. So... Anyway, they decide to have the content of Dick Carter Speedway. So Mike Lang, who was the organizer at Woodstock, he's here. He's on hand for this event. And basically, you know, he's on the phone and they say, look, Mike, can you move from Sears Point Wasteway all the way to Altamont? They literally had like 48 hours notice to do this. And they said, well, we can do it. People don't want to do it, but they can do it. Maybe they and maybe they shouldn't have in retrospect. OK, so anyway, so all these volunteers go out to Sears Point Raceway and they take and disassemble the scaffolding and the stage and they load it up and they bring it all the way 60 miles to Altamont to set it up there. Now, just an idea about some of the logistical problems that this was going to uh, 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 demonstrate was that there was a narrow road leading to the speedway and so the highway patrol is like, well, how are we going to park all these cars? So they asked Mr. Carter, how many people can you fit on your lot of land? And he goes, oh, about like 80,000. He goes, well, we got, you know, uh, all, we got 100,000 or $120,000 worth of cars, you know, uh, coming there. How are we going to, like, park all these cars? And so did Mr. Carter goes, oh, well, um, there's some adjoining landowners who I think will go along with this. And he goes, well, they're the ones that are complaining. They don't want even the thing to go forward yet. So... But whatever, and, and this is <laughs> again. So the, the, it manages to, to have it there. They have it. They have it at the concert. They have the concert there, and and you see from a helicopter view all these cars lined up like miles and miles and miles. I mean, from the actual concert. Okay, so now let's get down to the brass tack. So now uh, some of the bands that are playing are the Wild Burrito Brothers, uh, the Flying Burrito Brothers. I'm sorry, uh, Santana, uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash. Um, and Jefferson Airplane, and of course the Stones, and the Grateful Dead was supposed to play also. So now the issue came like, well, what's gonna, who's gonna be security for this concert event? So at the suggestion, uh, I believe it was the suggestion of Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead, he said, why don't you use the Hell's Angels? Now the Stones thought it was a good idea, and from what I've read, the Stones can, may have confused the Hell's Angels motorcycle gang in, of California with this Hell's Angels type of biker group or dancing group or whatever from London, and they're not the same thing, all right? So basically, the legend has it that Sam Cutler, the organizer of the, of the concert, made some type of deal with, uh, with, the, uh, with the, uh, the agreement of the, uh, the Stones and the Hell's Angels to pay the Hell's Angels $500 worth of alcohol to stand by the stage and guard the equipment and make sure no one hassled the musicians. Now, the problem with this setup is that everything was a rush. The stage was like on a hill and not very high up off the ground. And the Hells Angels parked their bikes in front of the stage. And, you know, if you're a Hells Angel, this bike is everything to you. And they kind of like stood in line, you know, in front of the stage. And um, also the, there was not a lot of urinals and places like that. I mean, this is, this is what happens when you rush things. OK, so anyway. The, the Hells Angels are tasked with the assignment of uh, guarding security. And, and they had, like, they were armed themselves with these pool cues that were sold off with, like, metal at the end. And basically what happened was as, as the crowd was trying to listen in, they moved in and, like, were, um, you know, banging into the bikes and banging into the, and so the, the Hells Angels started, like, swinging the pool cues and hitting people and, you know, hurting them. So actually in the scene, and this is demonstrated in the uh, Gimme Shelter movie, uh, when the Flying Burrito Brothers are playing, and they're playing Six Days on the Road, and I'm going to make it home tonight. The, the crowd's all of a sudden at the end of the song. He's like, the, the band, the leader is like, you know, hey, calm down, stop fighting, you know. You don't have to hurt each other. You don't have to. And, like, the Hells Angels start swinging the sticks at people, and the, the crowd is, like, you know, running away, you know. So it seems like it calms down a little bit. And then um, the next part 
uh, where it starts getting a little freaky. Jefferson Airplane comes up, and they're on the stage, and they I think they start singing uh, The Other Side of This Life, and Marty Ballon is singing, and, and Grace Slick is singing. And sure enough, there again, this this fights break out between the crowd and and the and the Hell's Angels, and they're hitting people with the pool sticks. And so Jefferson Airplane stops, and actually, um, Marty Ballon, the lead singer of the Jefferson Airplane, jumps into the crowd to try to break up the fracas, and he knocks him unconscious. So this is really bad. And Paul Cantor, the other lead singer of Jefferson Airplane, goes, "I like to thank the Hell's Angels for knocking out my lead singer." So one of the Hell's Angels gets on the stage, is like, "Hey, you, you talking to me?" Like kind of like a Joe Pesci thing. He's like, "No, man, I'm talking to the guy that knocked out my lead singer." It's like you know, it's like you know, I was, let me tell you what's happening. You, what's happening? And people start fighting again. So the like, Grace Lick is like, you know, uh, it's really something really weird is going on here. It's like you know. Uh, sometimes you need, uh, the angels because people get a little weird and start, like, touching each other, but angels, you don't go beating, you know, people up for nothing, so, uh, both sides are effing up, so let's stop effing up, okay? So, at this point, Jerry Garcia shows up, and, like, so, now he's the one that has, has been, has been, uh, 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 sort of, uh, I don't want to say blamed, but sort of made the suggestion of the Hells Angels. And so one of the road is, hey, yeah, the, the Hells Angels are beating up on musicians. He goes, well, really? And like, you know, it's like, yeah, Marty got beat. The Hells Angels are beating up on musicians. So like, he gets scared. And I think they were supposed to play and they flew off. <laughs> they didn't play at Altamont. They're like, oh my God, what do we do? So now it's getting later and the Stones are going to show up and uh, and play. Now, it's it's like about 5 or 6 o'clock at night. It's getting dark. Everyone's drunk, and they're getting in a foul mood. And what might have been some rather sinister foreshadowing of this is that when the Stones landed to get into the, the dressing room, uh, you know, and, you know, for the for the concert for later, somebody punched Mick Jagger as they got out of the, out of the helicopter. They goes, I hate you, you know, so like, now this is He's not even on yet, and like you can tell, like the forces of of evil are starting to you know uh, evolve, you know, uh, to, to grow around him. So anyway, the Stones come on, and there's, there's been really a weird uh, sort of folklore about why they went on late. Uh, one somebody said that Bill Wyman missed the, the helicopter ride, and he was late, but I don't buy that, you know. And so the Stones come on, and they start, and sure enough, I think they were playing. Um, uh, they were playing Simply for the Devil, and one of the bikes of the Hells Angels bikes blows up, and the crowd starts to like try to put like the the, the, like, the try to extinguish the uh, the smoke that's coming out of the bike, and like the Hells Angels like you know that's their you know the Hells Angels value their bikes you know like above everything, so they start attacking the crowd with the pool crews and everyone they, they, the crowd just like disperses disperses, and um. You know, and then Keith Richards is like, oh, the guy's bike blew up, man. You know, <laughs> so it's like, and then he's trying to like, Keith Richards goes, if that cat doesn't stop it, man. You know, he's trying to like say like, you know, because these people are fighting and, you know, and, and Mick Jagger's like losing. It's like, why are we fighting? Why are we fighting? Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters. Why are we fighting? Because if we are all one, show we're all one, you know, something like that. And you could tell he's scared because the situation is becoming uncontrollable. So, the Stones then go into, and I, I thought it, this happened when they were playing Under My, uh, Simply the Devil. It actually happened when Under My Thumb was playing. This African-American gentleman named Meredith Hunter shows up, and you, they, they, you see this, and he's wearing this lime green suit, and he's with this pretty white girl. And I guess, I don't know what started what, but I don't think the Hells Angels took too kindly to that. Remember, this is 1969, so like the race relations weren't great just they aren't so great now but again there's the civil rights movement and, and things like that so i believe that they must have insulted or something and he pulls out a gun and and the hell's angels some of the hell just they swarm him and you see this knife in the air and they stab him and they drive him they, they drag him off stage the stones don't see what's happening and it turns out that he was dead and this is also documented in the give me shelter uh movie and so he's dead. And the Stones finish up their set and leave. And you also see in the film like the cops show up and they and they, they, they put the you know they put the gentleman on the on the on the uh, trolley to take him away and he is now dead. 
And the stones, the way this ends, especially in the Give Me Shelter movie, is that the, Mick Jagger's in the film studio watching the film of the concert. And actually, David Maisel actually uh, plays back the scene where you can see the, the scuffle break out and, you know, uh, then the knife in the air and, and this gentleman getting stabbed. And it was really unfortunate. So people have said what well, was supposed to be, you know, Woodstock West became Paradise Lost. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, this put the Stones in a very bad light. Um, some critics of the film in general uh, have said that, uh, you know, it kind of goes a little bit too easy on them. The Stones really were uh, just on this breakneck pace to get this movie out at all costs. And the proper thing to do would have been in hindsight was to have the concert at Cedar Point Raceway because they were all set up to have it and their own personnel admitted this in the office. Now, from what I understand in the aftermath of all this, a number of people got, some people got killed, a number of cars got stolen. And of course, Meredith Hunter unfortunately lost his life uh, due to the Hells Angels. Meredith Hunter's family, I believe, sued the Rolling Stones or thought about suing the Stones or was gearing up to sue the Stones for a wrongful death action. A number of the adjoining landowners' property was damaged. They sued the Stones. Uh, the Stone suits uh, just went raceway and filmways breach a contract, rightfully so. Think for the million, 11, $11 million dollar lawsuit, and the Stones pretty much hit out um, for the rest of uh, 1970. Uh, they were just out of it at that point, and it was a real sobering experience. And it's really sad because it was meant to be a lot of fun and it just shows how the whole situation deteriorated. So that was it. And ironically, I read about this, that there was a plot to kill Mick Jagger, allegedly, because the, um, the interesting, uh, you know, end note on this, that the Hells Angels, and you see this in the movie, that the Hells Angels felt that Mick Jagger put the blame for the violence and ultimate solely on them. And they were mad about that. He felt that they, that they felt that he sold them out. So I believe there was a former FBI informant that was working for the Hell's Angels or joined up with them, you know, to track their movements. And there was a plot to kill him. Uh, one weekend, Mick Jagger was going to be in Montauk, and the Hell's Angels knew this, so they rented out a boat and they were going to launch an attack at night and go to this house where he was at Montauk and kill him. But there was a storm, and so the boat capsized. And they wound up not going through with the plot, and they never, like, reinitialized re it again. So that's pretty interesting to know. But anyway, um, so that's it. Uh, you know, the Altamont concert. And, uh, you know, I, I strongly urge that you try to watch it. It is available on YouTube. Um, I've seen it a few times, uh, actually on DVD, uh, there's a DVD version of it. And it was 50 years ago today that that all went down. And, uh, so it was a really bad day for the stones. It was a sad day, bad day. And I guess when you think of the give me shelter song, you know, rape murder, it's just a shot away. And that's what it was that day. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. And, uh, when you get a chance, try and watch the give me shelter movie. And uh, I think you'll find it very interesting. And uh, please comment. Thank you.